Thank you. Uh, I'm not going to bother you or waste our uh, valuable time here by introducing our company. I think if you, have, if you are interested, you can, ask me, you can ask me later. The only thing which I have to say at the, at, the, at, at the very beginning is that we are a small private photogrammetry company with our own flight fleet of, of airplanes. And therefore, we do not have that much time for research. So what you can see now is just a post-research based on a project that we did. I'm also not going to go too much into the details about the phase one uh, scanning station because as far as I understand, you may hear it later in this session, in one hour or so. So, uh, so uh, it's except of the presentation which, which is maybe taking place today. I don't, I'm not sure. Will you, will you present the scanning station today? Okay, so uh, that, that, that's nice. There are some publications which you can hear on that, which you can uh, read on that. And it's enough to say just that it's one of the attempts or one of the, one of the things which, can, uh, which uh, targets on replacing the standard uh, high precision photographic scanners by s new, modern, faster devices which would allow scanning this huge amounts of data which you heard about uh, in, in previous presentations in shorter time than it is possible with the classical photogrammetric uh, scanners. Uh, the start of I don't the, the start of my, my presentation or start the the base of my presentation is was very innocent. We got a project Orientierung historischer Luftbilder from Landesamt für Geoinformation und Land des Landtechnikum Baden-Württemberg, and uh, <laughs> this project was relatively large, around 40,000 square kilometers. 4,300 pictures from the year 75 and 81, and uh, the required accuracy, the, the project was not about scanning, the pictures can scan to us. But our, our, our task was to make the aerial triangulation and provide the exterior orientations from the pictures. And the required accuracy was around, was around 2 meters in position and under 3 meters in, in the height. Uh, we did the aerial triangulation, I have to say that it was not without some fight. But of course, this is something which we are used to with historical imagery, because the, the because the origins of the historical imagery are sometimes not 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 not, not very sure, uh, and so the classical photogrammetric procedures, uh, area triangulations, they sometimes apply very well. Sometimes you have to fight with it. So, uh, however, we have not expected the fight here. Because the visual quality of the imagery and also the quality and the completeness of their metadata which we received from the client was, compared to other projects, exceptional. For example, they were, there was the complete set of uh, calibration protocols available for all the pictures which were in the project, which is not very usual. Uh, we have not been aware that the data were not scanned with a standard photogrammetric scanner. We thought, okay, photogrammetric scanner, standard data. So uh, when we started fighting with it, we were not aware what was the reason of the fight, of, of, the, of, the, of the problems we had. So we contacted the client. We found out that uh, the, 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 the pictures were scanned with this phase one scan station. And uh, OK, so we then finished the project. Uh, the results which, which you had, which, which we had were, I would say, not perfect, but acceptable. Uh, but the, even after completing the project, there was a feeling that more investigation to the, yeah, to the results wasn't, were needed. Uh, luckily for us, uh, not that lucky for the client, but luckily for us, uh, parts of the, of the area of Baden-Württemberg were not covered by the pictures. And uh, we had to add additional pictures from the neighboring state of I have a German, so Bayern, but uh, for you, Bavaria. Uh, there was a difference between the pictures. The pictures from Baden-Württemberg were, were have, uh, had a little bit uh, smaller scale. They were scanned on the phase one scan station, and they have 22.5 micron scan resolution. The pictures from Bavaria were 
a little bit, a little bit uh, higher resolution. They was originally scanned on, on the good old size Photoscan PD uh, re- scanner, and they have 21 micrometer resolution. So that's uh, so we. Uh, as a part of this, uh, as a part of this post research, we made a comparison between those pictures and between the results of, the, of, of these pictures, uh, because in the because in the in the previous slide, what, what you have seen here, the pictures are combined. So these are these are combined results. We then we then we then made uh, smaller blocks, which consisted only of the pictures from the particular states, in order to find out what is the difference. And it started already in the interior orientation. Uh, on the left you see the results from the interior orientation from the pictures from the, from the phase one scanner. On the right side from Bavaria, from the really classic photogrammetric scanners. I, I would say these are about typical, typic, typical results. Like this one, this is what we expect from photogrammetric yeah, for the, in, the, in the good old times when the interior orientation was inevitable. And this is what we get there. And once again, this did not rise our suspicion at all, because this, this something like that, this is normal with historical imagery. Yeah. You cannot rely on the geometry of the historical imagery. So we said, okay, yeah, this is like it is. So then, uh, what I did now is to compare, not to do the modern uh, autocorrelation, but do the classical relative orientation as it, as it was done in the old times. And again, there is a, there is, there is a difference. Oh, it's, it's not too much readable, is it? Ah, sorry. So, so here, the sigma, here the sigma naught of the relative variation was around <laughs> something between 20, below 20 microns. It's down there, I do not have a point here. No. Sorry? Will it be visible? Ah, it is. Yes. Okay. So, thank you. So it is here. Yes, it's, it's something like 18.7 microns. And with the imagery scanned on the classical scanner, it's once again here and it's 3.5 microns. So that's, that, that's the principal difference. It, it, it doesn't show that the, it, it shows that there are, the, in the imagery there are some, some hidden, I would say hidden distortions which are not described by the, by the, by the calibration protocols and which uh, must be removed. The removal we tried by, by using uh, area tra- triangulation with additional parameters, so by self-calibration. Uh, the table, which is now, yeah, that's visible, that's, that's nice, uh, now shows, uh, and I would say one thing, there are two differences. Uh, first, as I, as, I, as, as I said before, the pictures from, from Bavaria were of a little bit uh, uh, higher scale, so, so, so better resolution. And of co- uh, uh, additionally, the source of the ground control points for Baden-Württemberg and Bavaria were, the, we, we were not comparable. The, the source of the ground control points from Bavaria were much uh, more suitable for the, for the task, or much better, I would say, for of better quality. Whereas we had, uh, we had uh, as, a, as, as the primary source in Baden-Württemberg orthophoto, and, uh, and then pictures, uh, then points, which were usually on the ground, but, but we, cannot, we could not identify them on the, on the historical pictures. So we have to combine uh, planimetric points from the orthophotos and <coughs> altimetric points from, from the, from the, from the uh, ground control points archive. In Bavaria, most of the ground control points were uh, house roofs, so corners, and many of the houses, because the pictures are not at all, Many of the houses where we had the ground control points were, were, were present in the picture, so that was much easier. So please do not compare the RMS of the ground control points, just observe the, the, just observe the uh, effect of the additional parameters, which is perfectly, uh, which can be demonstrated like very positive on the pictures from Baden-Württemberg, but relatively neg- negligible on the pictures of, uh, of Bayern, which uh, once again shows there, is, there was something inside the, the uh, uh, phase one scan stations imagery. And this already, okay, I forgot I have this one. So this is, this, these are, okay, readable. 
These are the typical, typical uh, additional parameters values now from HLT. On the right side you see Bayern, on the left side you see Baden-Württemberg and, and the pictures were really, there were quite a few cameras. Some of them were relatively fine, like, uh, like the one on the top. Some of them were, yeah, not that fine, like the one, like the one at, at the bottom. And I can also say that I have not shown it here. Some of them were really horrible, but uh, I think that, that that can be an exception. But also, what, 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 what you can see, I'm not that much expert in additional parameters, so maybe some of you who, who knows it well. Uh, but this, this, this two, I'm sorry, seven and eight. This is the radial. This is this is the radial influence, and these are in fact the only one which can be which can be well described between different between different softwares. The other ones are not that easy. So, as the conclusion uh, from this from this small research, we, we, we said that uh, that the imagery from scan scan stations phase one scan stations shows shows, I would not say a lower geometrical quality, because that's not true, but lower geometrical stability as the imagery from the high precision photogrammetric scanners. There are still some distortions left. Uh, the AT behavior is much closer to the, to the uh, aerial triangulation made from non-metric or, as I said, less metric cameras, uh, middle format cameras, which not that well calibrated, uh, calibrated uh, 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 focal, focals, and uh, therefore, for the for the uh, aerial triangulation to get reliable results, uh, self calibration with additional parameters is needed. And here we come to the problem. This, and also the application of correction grid, is excellent if you work within one software environment. So if you start in, uh, in one software environment and go with your production line in the same. Uh, software environment. You, okay, you can always keep and you can always uh, look as always uh, forward the results as they were in the previous steps. Whereas if you want to go to another application, you make, you make your, you make your area triangulation and self-calibration or whatever corrections in one application, these are in the practice, I'm talking in the practice, very hard to transfer to another, to another software. So uh, as the conclusion I would say the pictures, I mean, I, I suppose that the scan station is excellent for archiving, excellent for preserving the national heritage, but if it goes to processing, it must go with a clear red tag, please scan on phase one scan station, and must be, uh, yeah, must be uh, handled with care. Thank you. Well, good, uh, good morning to everybody, or is it afternoon yet? I'm not sure. <laughs> good morning, everybody, ladies and gentlemen. Um, first, I'd like to, as uh, Fabio introduced, there to talk about prompt scan and, and the rapid scanning of aerial film archives. I'd like to thank the Euro SDR team for the invitation here and also for facilitating being able to uh, demonstrate the, uh, the scanner in the room next door. Uh, I know some of you have seen it already and I would hope that you would have the time if possible to be able to see it afterwards at some stage, ask any questions as to its operation. From <coughs> we come from a background of aerial photography um, and we've realised I think that uh, time is one of the critical dimensions that's possibly missing from a lot of data, geospatial data that's being created. Um, the company we were born out of uh, MAPS Geosystems and the, the owner, the ex-owner of MAPS was Rolf Becker and he realised that there, this time element is critical in the use of geospatial data. Uh, he set up Geodyne in 2015 and engaged or embarked then on the development of what we consider to be crucial to, to, the, um, to this element of the time which is to be able to scan fast, cost-effectively, these millions of films that are worldwide deteriorating, has to be said, 
languishing in various archives throughout the world. It's a huge, as I don't need to tell you, but there's a huge amount of important and valuable information that's stored there. The only obstacle being how to get it into the digital format. And so <coughs> I embarked on the, dem on the um, development of prompt scan uh, using photographic technology, using industrial cameras, multiple in cameras to be able to get the, the resolution that's, re that's required. Uh, and this has been done during the last five, six years building a lot on the experience that we gained during, well, as MAPS Geosystems, a lot of work was done from the aerial photography side of things, especially there was a lot of, um, a lot of work, development work that was done with airborne GPS and the like. So it put us in good stead, and the company in good stead, to be able to develop further and to what we consider to be a hole in the, in the, um, in the technological market, if you like, to be able to get the fast scanning. Now, that's given us, in, since 2015, we've, we've had a lot of experience in doing it, we've been developing, and we will continue to develop to make it faster, to make it uh, more accessible as we go through, but at the moment, we have, <coughs> we have prompt scan, those, as you, some of you have seen next door. Uh, we've been operating in four different continents over the last three, four years. In Malaysia, we've had projects we've completed. Uh, in Oman, uh, we're working in the States. So we're slowly but surely finding these archives <coughs> and then deploying prompt scan there to be able to deal with the, the problem of getting rapid acquisition. We have our, our business model is not so much to, to sell the scanner, we don't believe that that is an effective way. Once an archive has been scanned, our scanner, which is quite specialised, admittedly for different types, we can scan films, we can scan contact prints, various types of films, 5 inch films, 9 inch, this sort of thing. But once the archive has been scanned, that, that, that is, uh, the, the scanner itself becomes you know, uh, redundant, if you like, for that particular organisation. And in, in, this, in these days of sustainability, our aim is then to take the scanner back, upgrade it if necessary, and certainly recommission it, and then pass it on to the next project as such. Now, we can also, we have different ways of doing this. We can either, if the archive is large enough, then we would deploy a prompt scan, or one or two instruments possibly, to a particular agency. Uh, we have, we believe that you, your people, your companies, you are the best people who are most familiar with your archive. You probably know the data inside out. And as such, we would we recommend, and this is where we are based our model on this fact, that you would use your own resources to be able to use our equipment on a lease basis with our technical training and, and support throughout the project. Now, there are a number of different ways we could do that. We can either we could send it, as I said, to your pay, or we could deploy prompt scan and people to, to be able to operate it during for the, for the duration of that. Alternatively, um, it's possible if it's not such a large archive, it may be more cost effective to actually send the films to us at a central location and then we scan everything and send the results and the films back to you on that. Now, <coughs> I've talked a bit about the scanning and especially the scanner that's here. We are not per se a scanning company. That was not our aim. Our aim is <laughs> the scanning is a means to an end and the end is to get that data, that uh, archive data into an accessible format for further use. So as such we are able to offer a number of different uh, over and above the scanning we're also able to offer services with regards to the next stage, which is the georeferencing of that data, further either refining it then with a triangulation, orthorectification, and then to publish that data in whatever a number of different formats that are available. Also, we're <coughs> in the process of looking at the, the, the next stage beyond that, which is extracting features either manually or, or um, or uh, automatically. Uh, the concept on <coughs> the bottom right is probably familiar. 
We all know, I'm sure there are archives taking up a lot of space everywhere. Uh, now what we, as I said, mentioned it was a, a lease, we're doing a lease on this, so, but to reduce that lease period, what we want to do is to maximize the use of prompt scan when it, while it's at your premises, in that case. So what we, uh, what we recommend highly is that we do a catalogue of your archive, or you do a catalogue of your archive, before we mobilise anything to site. Uh, this means we will provide, for example, labels, whereby a QR code label, simple QR code label, which will identify the film, give a unique, obviously, to that film, which will then be tracked through the whole process. Um, <clears throat> we will also have, as you can see on the top, top right there, we will have a, a sort of a, a simple data, the start of a database which uh, at this stage just says, okay, my, my film is in a particular shelf, in a particular um, location within your archive. This might be useful later because you might want to say, I, I don't want to just take everything out of, this, out of the archive and scan it as it comes out. I might say I want to do certain films, in which case to be able to locate it afterwards is useful information. Um, with that information, we, we, from, we enter into the Android device um, uh, the information that's just required, the native, that, well, if the original name of the film, we're assigning an, uh, a, a unique ID, but there will be your company uh, film number, which is important to be linked to. And this will start the database, so we will be compiling the information. If there's a film report, if there's information on the, end of the, uh, on the outside of the canister, this is all recorded and can be used for later, later information. <coughs> we would also, uh, we would also uh, provide um, a prompt reviewer, um, I think as... Um, as alluded to earlier uh, with regard to the scarcity of uh, light tables now unfortunately a lot of companies uh, found that there's no longer any use for them uh, a lot of that sort of thing and they've been thrown away what we have also developed which can also be mobilized in advance of, of uh, prompt scan being there in, on site is a combined uh, reviewer so it's possible then to view each film to extract more information to make sure and ensure that the state of the film is good and it also we've got in as you can see here in the center of it if there are splices which if they're 30 40 years old are likely to be very hard and brittle and broken so we want to make sure that a the film is is cleaned there's a combined cleaner on this as well to clean remove the dust that's accumulated it's spliced it's in a proper condition to be able to to be able to go through into the prompt scan we also, at that stage, fill out a work order in the bottom, the bottom right, uh, which gives the information which is required by prompt scan to be able to start scanning the film. Uh, this is mainly the, <coughs> the actual type of film, whether it's colour, negative, positive, what have you, but also some other information with regard, which can, may not be necessary for the scanning itself, but will be used later, possibly, for the triangulation. <coughs> With regard to the actual scanning operation itself, we, the, once the scanner is on site, it's probably about half a day to be able to set it up, to get it uh, calibrated, do a system setup, calibration, and then we're in action. Now, <coughs> the, the main thing on this with the calibration, with regard to the calibration, we do a, a fairly frequent geometric calibration. Uh, this takes about one minute and it can be done before normally at the beginning of the day scanning and then possibly the end of the morning and again maybe mid-afternoon, late afternoon, that sort of thing. Now this, <coughs> this is photographing a very fine grid, a uh, five millimeter grid of points uh, and this information will then be used to, uh, to uh, compensate for any lens distortion or other other anomalies within the, uh, the system itself, which can be then modelled during the processing stage. Now, <clears throat> that is done, so we do one before, let's say, when we process the films, then the film itself, when it's processed, it looks for the previous calibration, which could be maybe half an hour, an hour or so beforehand, it looks for the forward calibration afterwards, and then uses that information to be able to, to process that particular film. There's also a radiometric calibration as well, but that's performed possibly on a daily basis. But it's all to make sure that the system is, 
is stable and also that it's being monitored, constantly monitored. If there are any issues, we immediately find out from the, uh, from the report files. Loading the film, <coughs> it's, um, it's a manual, obviously, um, and, uh, but once that's there, we then bring out, invoke the, the work order, which gives all the information, and the, scan, and the film can then be scanned. Uh, alternatively, uh, we, there are obviously a lot of cut films and things like that, so we have an adapter that can be used then if there are, if there are films, boxes of films that have been cut. Uh, there obviously takes a little bit longer due to the manual intervention that's required for those. So our <clears throat> once our, the film is completed, um, the information itself is then automatically processed. It's being downloaded onto an SSD. Uh, that is then processed. As soon as the film finishes, we do a processing of all the overviews to create the overviews for each image. This is very fast. Uh, using uh, once that information has been processed into those overviews it's then possible for the operator to look at that while the next film is being scanned just to make sure that a, the, everything is there there are no, uh, no anomalies within the, uh, within the frames that have been captured maybe a half frame by mistake or maybe it's something that's caused by damage to the film that sort of thing so that's our preliminary QC uh, and also information is there from the statistics uh, and also, uh, at this stage, it's possible to say, okay, I don't want my whole film. Maybe at the end of the film, there are 15 frames that were just of the airfield itself or the runway or something like that. I don't want those. I delete them as the overviews. They will not then be processed to full, full resolution. <coughs> this, is the, uh, this is the family of, uh, <coughs> of uh, prompt scan that we have at the moment. Uh, including one that's uh, in sort of gestation. Uh, we have uh, the, the most, the one that we have next door is the M2, and this is most suitable for, for uh, archives of 200,000 plus. That sort of thing. It's a normal, it's uh, a native scan at uh, 12.5 micron. So we can do color, pan. Uh, we have a 2 micron photogrammetric accuracy on that, and we're capturing everything 12 bit. Uh, it's automated. We have uh, we have the sensors there, which I hope you can have a look at there. Which uh, we adapt uh, uh, to it, to each different film type. Although this has now been modified so that we're just about getting every different type of camera that's available is being detected. The edge of the film is being de detected correctly. Uh, <coughs> we also have a prompt scan M1, which is more of a library scanner. So this is more uh, <coughs> at 15 microns, and it's a manual feed, so if it's a small archive, maybe 5,000 images or something like that, then this can be done. It's a, it's a more cost-effective model than the M2. The M3 is more adaptable. It's, uh, <coughs> it's actually the whole thing upside down, uh, because uh, as you can see, it's a larger, it's, uh, it's got... Um, a larger focal length on there and that's more adaptable for different types of film for example we can do reconnaissance a five inch reconnaissance film we can do that using uh, inside we're using a phase one camera uh, which makes the which makes the capture and the processing that much easier also as i say in the pipeline uh, we've got the <coughs> the M2 XL uh, which is actually a 30 by 30 centimeter which would be useful for films in northern Europe that sort of thing which we know there are a lot of uh, uh, archives which will, will do that so again it's an adaptation of the existing models okay the process at the next stage is the processing uh, again it's automated it's a question of removing the SSD from the scanner into another machine and letting everything do its, do its work. It takes automatically the calibration images and then processes everything through. Now, as well as that, it's got prompt dodger, so we're doing, <coughs> as you can see in the bottom right, we're doing the um, uh, light fall off, compensation for light fall off, and also enhancing the image to make sure that we're, we're retaining the full dynamic range that we've captured during the, um, during the prompt scan. In addition to the dodging, uh, we've got prompt assure, so we can extract the fiducials. 
Uh, we can extract the friend number, so the fiducials will be used for the, for, for the next stage for the triangulations. Uh, also as a, as a very valuable QC check on the data, the geometric data. The OCR will be used then for the frame number so that we can then, at the end of it, deliver the, the full resolution images with the correct camera frame number. Uh, this also <coughs> the, produces a lot of the printouts, etc., that are required for QC, uh, just to look at the, um, to, to, be able to, uh, to be able to review the, um, the images. So at the end of this, at the end of this process, we have geometrically and radiometrically corrected images in the in the required format, depending on uh, our, our customers' requirements. Having finished the scanning, this is the more <laughs> the more interesting part of things uh, is the georeferencing. Um, we have developed a prompt relate. Uh, one of the issues that we've got, we've encountered, is that uh, many of the older photography archives have no flight indices whatsoever, very little information, uh, in which case it's virtually impossible to find out where some of these films are. Uh, we've had a recent experience in Malaysia, which is quite a heavily forested area, and that was, uh, before we developed this, uh, it was proving to be quite considerably a, a problem. To take an individual image, find where it is, big problem. Make it into a strip, and suddenly you have a lot more information, and it makes life a lot easier. So we developed Prompt Relate to be able to create these strips with feature matching, uh, and then we go to the next stage, which unfortunately just disappeared, uh, into to do the georeferencing of those strips once they're there, bring them into, for example, ArcGIS, using the world the base map, and then orientate them, rotate, scale, until we find the, uh, the correct position of those images. From there, we can then extract the frame center coordinates in real world, in uh, admittedly approximate, but in, in, uh, in real world coordinates, whichever system. Having got that information, which is our starting point for the triangulation, we've got our accurate location, or reasonably accurate location, approximate, and we've got the orientation of the frames. Then it's a question of putting in everything into our prompt to AT, which again is a, a, an efficient way of getting the center point coordinates, which is what we're at, and orientation parameters, accurate parameters that we're after. <coughs> so at the end of this, we have we have all the information now that we need. We've got our aero triangulation reports, we've got our coordinates, we've done the bundle block adjustment. Now we can move on to the next stage, which, is the, uh, which will be the autorectification. Again, using, in this case, using prompt ortho, we're doing a lot of ortho generation. Now we're beginning to get to the stage where this information is becoming far more useful to, to you. Uh, even <coughs> having scanned an individual image, uh, the, the, the usefulness of that single image is nothing compared to uh, the end product that we have here, which is the author photo. Uh, and from this, we can create the various layers. And now we're coming into the aspect of the time function of this, whereby we can generate, as, as we've seen in other demonstrations today, this layers of different temporal aerial imagery, which is which is uh, crucial um, and which in many cases will be, as we have here, a lot of this information will not exist anywhere else. Aerial photography, as we know, is uh, we're doing a project back to 1928 at the moment. There will be nothing else existing that will be able to describe the, uh, the situation of terrain at almost a century ago, except for aerial photography. And as such, we need to get that information into a digital format. We can also <coughs> publish, publish the information. So we have uh, various applications. We are using a lot of ArcGIS um, <coughs> products for that. Uh, but this is all, all that information is readily available to go into those kind of systems that we want to, we want to uh, promote. <coughs> Uh, just feature extraction again it's something that we're 
we are in the process of working on having got this information uh, we have been doing some work on that but there's still a lot more to be done on the fact of integrating deep learning into the, uh, <coughs> with the use of imagery and that sort of thing to be able to to do inferencing and on the scanned imagery uh, whether it's done on the single imagery single images which is far more effective or on the, on the ortho images <coughs> afterwards then we have both the products that are available to be used on that. So, just in conclusion, these are the services we can offer. We would like to work with people uh, from this. If you're only interested in scanning, fine. We can provide the technology and that for the scanning technology and the support for the scanning. If you want to be involved, your personnel to be involved in other if there's a requirement for any sort of uh, <coughs> online support from ourselves, we can do that. But our main aim is to be able to work with you to be able to develop uh, your services and to develop the, the, the transfer of the archive from this analog format into something that is far more readily usable and extremely useful information. I will... Again, just say, our scanner is out there in the next room. I would like, I would welcome you to go and have a look, ask as many questions. Well, I'm happy to be here because as a German company, we have enough time. We must not watch always football. So I'm happy <laughs> to be here and present our new scanner. I just want to... <laughs> It is what it is, yes. Maybe driving bicycle is better for us. Okay, here we are. I want to present our new prototype scanner of the AFS 150. This is the aerial film scanner 150. He's fast and he's also precise. Um, creating your own geodata is sometimes difficult work, as you see in this in this graphics, uh, the man has here and there are some problems. We have had XYZ to define 3D geodata all over the years and decades, and time is the first dimension, that's why 4D. And so we think 4D geodata is very important. Um, in just in web applications, it is an advantage if, advantage if you have can use time series and uh, there are many analog photographs, they must be digitized to use. After this digitizing, the, the photogrammetric work starts. Well, means that uh, it must be fast. The problem with the old scanners, old technology, mostly 25 years old, they are not bad, but they are slow. And as you know, I must not mention it, but historical air photos will not live forever. We have a big problem with bacteria and, and all these things, so the information can go out. Uh, and we think that each photo is unique, and if we want to save this, we must do now something. And there are millions of photos, they must be digitized. And from our experience, uh, uh, very often the security requirements uh, does not allow to hand over some images in another country or another house, so I think the scanner must come into this building. So, and here is our new scanner. Next room, we can show it physically. It's our prototype, um, but the principle is clear. We must not change anything. Okay, we must change some small parts, but it's a prototype, and so learning by doing. Uh, we have constructed this. This is our first model uh, in our upcoming photo scanner family, and there are knowledge and experience from over 30 years inside. Uh, and we thought that it must be simple and easy to use this scanner. It's not always necessary to have an academic degree 
to stand in front of the scanner. It must be simple. So there is a very simple software design based on our experience and we thought that the transparent hood is good to see the process of scanning when he's working. So and um, the problem himself is a roll film scanner or a single image scanner. If you want to combine both capabilities, the problem is bigger. Uh, so we have solved this with a real system and a manual lighter and both working mechanisms are possible. The AFS has an achromatic sensor. This is a phase one camera with 150 megapixel. That means one channel, that means black and white. Um, for us it was very important. We talked about distortion and all the things from this design. We have one sensor in the camera, in the phase one camera. Over them we have one lens system and this is enough to correct and to calibrate for us. We, it is difficult enough, but we want to make a very neutral image. In this scanned image should be not an influence shown from the scanner. It should be neutral. And then we can talk about the old aerial camera, then we can talk about the douches and so on. And so we have a special lighter. And this area of this 300 by 300 millimeter can uh, separately calibrate it so that the light source brings an adjusted light, homogeneous. We have measured a lot before we do this um, to produce the same light on, on each corner. In the corners, maybe a little bit more. We have uh, 256 uh, areas by 256 areas. And so we can, from the light source, give a light that brings the light fall off from the optics to the sensor. Um, the roll films are working automatically, very clear. This was not, not the biggest problem. And the lighter is sitting on the film with a pressure glass and we insist that this glass must be pressured on and we give them 25 kilogram pressure for the scan. So the weight of the glass is not enough for us. We have made our experience and so we make a, a pressure on it during this fast scan. Um, <clears throat> so the heart of the, cam uh, of the scanner is a phase one camera. We are working very good together with phase one and the sensor is sitting upstairs from the film stage and this is in the moment 150 megapixel native resolution and it brings over this um, width to a 22.5 microns resolution so this is physically what happens uh, when we use the liner 60 millimeter uh, lenses, we have to correct this lenses geometrical and we must adjust, it is very important um, if the, your camera is, is hanging on a yellow or a bottom tree pot, it's very difficult if the camera is up, is uh, over this how you can calibrate over the whole area the sharpness and the parallelity of the sensor finally sensor and, and film stage must be absolute parallel and we have done this very carefully we measured the resolutions in the corners and the centers and all over and so we got a pretty good calibration of these two parallel areas and we have also made uh, calibrations for the lenses. We have a very principal, simple workflow. At first is the scanning workflow. This must be easy and sharp. 
uh, and fast and uh, we store our metadata of the scan inside the header of this file. And so we created the temporary file format that's called AFS. It is only during this process and in second after scanning we want to bring all this information into this scanned uh, image uh, because inside this image during the scan you have the, an image and you have all distortions and all things from the camera, from the lenses, from all the things together and this will be removed during the post-processing unit um, this post-processing makes much more, you can click I want automatically crop this image, I want to dodge this image, I want to make a color balancing, this is all possible for you to define this and these are raster operations this takes time and so you should have a pretty good computer uh, threads River Pro or some things so to increase the speed of this and at the end of this so we have two steps and at the end of this second step you have a TIFF format in black and white on color the geometric calibration uh, I said it already is a parallel adjustment between camera and film stage and, and then we are measuring uh, grid crosses of, of over a grid plate better than one micron is this grid plate and then we calculate, calculate a distortion grid for this scanner and we store all these things in the metadata for the post processing the post processing must take this information to do something with this raw ADS image so and good advantage of phase one is that we can use an LCC a light correction table uh, we have done this and also the camera brings the capability of the light fall off in the corners that we can correct and we are applying these LCCs once again to this, all these images finally we once again we should have a neutral image um, so we can do this in black and white and in color um, the geometrical accuracy is better than 2 microns for the whole image because we have also corrections not only on the 4 fiducials or 8 fiducials we have also corrected inside the image here and there something ok you can say we have 20 microns and in all problems less than 10 microns less than half uh, pixel don't interest me but we make the design also for the next uh, machine type with 12 microns in, in spring next year um, so it is important for us that the image is correct not only on these four corners um, the measurements and the adjustments as shown here in the protocol and this is from the geometry uh, once again we have a black and white camera and we are working with all <coughs> film types also with paper films uh, and we make a red shot a green shot and a blue shot temporary and this takes three times more time than a black and white image so we talk black and white for two seconds and color image approximately six or seven seconds and then you're bringing these three red, green, blue files over each other the geometry is perfect and we do not have with this color production any effect of a bio array we do not have uh, pan sharpening effects, nothing we have this neutral image and within the next four weeks we are ready we have some problems in the moment in the next four weeks we will have the capability for analog contact copies technical specification, okay 
Um, I think we have 22. And always we talk about 8-bit, and from our experience, if you have less quality images, so more you need higher, more 14, the camera brings 14-bit, and we stretch it up to 16-bit. But in, in these cases, I think uh, we suggest use 16-bit per channel. It's better than the reduction of 8-bit. 8-bit, uh, you can nearly do nothing anymore. Um, okay, these are the parameters from the scanner. Times, old numbers, now we are in black and white by 2 seconds and 7, 6 seconds for true color. And the post-processing time is depending on the power of the computer. I have done this also with 15 and 30 seconds, but it takes a time. We calculating this raster image three times, and this must the computer do. Um, but as a number, and a normal simple working day of eight hours, you can digitize with such a machine 1,000 images. This is possible. 1,000 images a day, a normal day. If you have two cycles a day, it could be doubling the number. Okay, this is what I want to say, and I think I invite you to feel in touch uh, in the next room. The scanner is standing there. We can talk. We can go deeper in some details. Um, I invite you. Many thanks. Uh, so, I'm not from a private company, I'm just a scientific researcher uh, who tries to help valorizing a beautiful collection of historical aerial photographs we have at the Africa Museum on Central Africa. So, this, is, um, yeah, this collection has a huge potential for environmental uh, change uh, studies. Uh, but this collection is aging pretty badly, so we had to do something, but we do not have any money for that, so we have to find a low-cost solution, um, and this is what I will present uh, today. So just a few words about the collection. Uh, we have a bit less than 400,000 uh, historical IR photographs. They cover uh, mostly uh, Congo, Rwanda, and Burundi, the, the former Belgian colonies. Um, most of the collection is on Congo, of course, because if you know the superficie of this country, you can understand it's huge. It's uh, more than 80 times the size of Belgium. Uh, they mostly date back from the 1950s, but we will also have a bit uh, older images and images from the, the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, most of the time we have the flight plan, which is cool. Uh, but uh, we don't have any more information, so uh, no calibration report, no details of, uh, on how the survey uh, was performed. Maybe it's somewhere hidden in the Belgian uh, archives, but we don't know uh, yet. Um, so, in the collection, uh, we retrieve mostly three different types of cameras, uh, Fairchild and two wild cameras. Uh, but for these cameras, sometimes we have different uh, lenses, so it's not always the same focal length uh, and the same uh, distortion we have in the photograph. Uh, usually the focal length is known when we can read it on, uh, on the photograph. Sometimes it's not possible because it's overexposed, uh, but the flight plan can help in that situation. Most of the photographs are in paper format. We also have uh, glass plates and uh, also uh, films. Um, so most of, of the development we did uh, on, on, uh, to, to scan, uh, to digitize these collections and, uh, are for these uh, paper uh, photographs. And what we have uh, are copies, usually copies of the originals. We don't have the originals uh, in Belgium, they were uh, left uh, um, in, in, in Africa. Uh, sometimes they still exist, sometimes not. I will leave uh, my, uh, the pleasure of my, uh, for my colleague uh, François Kervin to present the collection in more details uh, in the, this afternoon and my presentation will focus on uh, how we do to digitize the photograph, pre-process the images and then uh, 
uh, process them with a photogrammetric software to get uh, something useful for scientific research. So just other information, you can see uh, we don't have very good photographs. Uh, we have issues with sun illumination, which is typical of uh, tropical uh, Africa. Uh, you have clouds, even though you fly below the, the clouds, you can have change, quick change of illumination uh, on the ground. You have uh, overexposure, underexposure of the photographs. You have noise dust. You have uh, very damaged uh, images with scratches. You have, well, we don't see it clearly, but we have a kind of vignetting, but it's not a vignetting uh, we have. It's more a deterioration of the emulsion, so we lose the information on the photograph. Uh, so it's, it's not possible to correct such kind of vignetting. <coughs> Uh, properly. Some scientists did use the photograph a few decades ago without thinking that at some point we will digitize that, so they used markers and started uh, interpreting the, the landscape uh, manually on the photographs. And then we have a difference of quality, of course, with very sharp data and uh, very blurry ones. Uh, and I don't talk about uh, other uh, issues like uh, the crack. It, uh, cracks in the photographs because of the aging of the emotion, etc., etc., etc. So first, how do we digitize that uh, and fast? Because um, we just make a quick calculation on how much time we need to uh, digitize all the collection with only one scanner, it, uh, a classical flatbed scanner, uh, a professional photograph uh, for, for photographs. Uh, it would take 20 years, so that's a big deal. So uh, what we did is to um, create a system with scanners, flatbed scanners in parallel, controlled by a, by a single uh, uh, computer, so an operator can scan four photographs at the same time. And uh, with such kind of equipment, we already uh, improve uh, the time, and we expect in the near future to double this installation so it means that in three to four years we should be able to have all the collections uh, perfectly uh, scanned. So we did that uh, simply with the Python script uh, with a Linux machine and, uh, and it's quite easy to, to implement a system with a graphical user interface to control the, these uh, scanners. So the parameters we use, uh, we scan at uh, 1600 dpi, which is about 16 micrometer, I think. Um, we uh, save the images in uh, TIFF formats and compress TIFF formats. Uh, and for the grayscale, uh, you have to know that these scanners you tend to, to stretch the, the grayscale <coughs> to the darkest and the, uh, using the darkest and the whitest uh, pixel. Uh, but we change that to avoid it. Uh, so we use the full range of uh, of the of the, the dynamic range of the, the scanner bar and uh, we save it in uh, 16 bits to be able to have as many uh, values as possible in this uh, grayscale. <coughs> so here is an example of the of, of the, the interface we got. You see that you can change the name and, and the, the area of scanning of each scanner. Usually it's already pre-defined uh, so you don't you just change the name um, you can change. You can choose the the, the scanning uh, resolution. Uh, you just uh, can create a preview, then run uh, the, the actual scanning. And here you have a button which is warming the scanners. When you look at the user guide of these scanners, they will they will say, they will tell you no need for warm up. Not true. Uh, it's better to we we saw it, we tested it and we saw a real big difference between the first scan and a uh, few scans later. So what we did is just to uh, start uh, every day, the, the operator uh, start the warm-up and uh, the scanners just scan uh, for a few times and then we can start the, the proper scanning uh, of the photographs. So um, we tested, we mostly tested three types of things on these scanners. is uh, the dynamic range uh, between the scanners because of course we have several scanners but we want to have the same quality of scan, the same range of grayscale on each scanner. So we discovered that they are relatively uh, scanned the same way, but a calibration uh, of the scanner is, of course, better. It improves a lot the, the quality. So we have a real, uh, real um, good uh, uh, 
similar uh, scans between the scanners. As I mentioned, uh, we uh, also tested the, the warm-up of the scanner and the fatigue along the day. So along the day, it's quite stable, uh, along the single day at least. Uh, and then also the ground vibration. So our scanners are on a table fixed to a wall. Uh, it's very nice, but we discovered something is um, when you have a table like that, if you uh, I do a shot like on the table, uh, you will have a, a vibration which is quite long in time and it will affect the scanner the same way. So you will have the same vibration in the scanner. But when you have a table attached to the wall, you have a side effect like we have with earthquakes. Meaning that the, the, the vibration in the table will be very small, but all the shock will, will, will vibrate in the scanner and then the scanner will move a lot. So we have to use um, an absorption mattress, uh, shock absorption mattress like we use below um, laundry machines, for example, and it really helps reduce this side effect. And then we have the best configuration to install the scanner. So now the image pre-processing. We have very bad data uh, with a lot of distortion in it, so I will quickly go through to all the steps we do. So in terms of image correction, we don't do that much, except if the image is very bad. Then we try to improve it. For example, if you have very big differences of expo exposure between two photographs of the same collection, uh, we will try to homogenize that, but we scan in a raw TIFF format. So first the images appear very black, uh, very dark, uh, but then once we have a product that we can use, we can start playing with uh, stretching of the, of the grayscale to, to have something uh, usable. Then what we do is a canvas sizing, so we add uh, rows and columns of black pixels to have images with the same dimension. Because sometimes, it was, it's less true now, but sometimes for the, during the, the first uh, scans uh, we did, uh, the operator didn't choose the same area in the scanner to scan, and then we have different dimensions. So we, do, we have to homogenize that. Then, fiducial mark detection is the, the most time-consuming step to pre-process the images. Uh, initially, we did it manually. It takes a lot of time. And then we started developing uh, something. We first asked uh, Clairvaux and, uh, and uh, uh, Tom Adaway from, uh, from BRGM to, to help us with that. They have a script to, to do that. But unfortunately, it didn't work uh, perfectly for, um, for uh, data sets. So what we did is to rewrite something uh, for which we train uh, the system with each data set. So we provide uh, examples of fiducial marks with the exact uh, coordinates of these fiducial marks taken manually. And then uh, we provide details about the camera. And the software will uh, use these training data to detect uh, uh, the, the fiducial max through the data set. So it works relatively well, but you have to be careful when you choose your training data, of course. And what we did also, because we never have a 100% match of all photographs, uh, we also developed a tool to uh, manually detect this uh, fiducial max. Uh, manually. You, know, just, you just move the image, zoom in, zoom out, and once you fit with the, 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 mark, uh, the red mark here, you just click on a button and, and the, the computer will take the coordinates, the pixel coordinates of the fiducial map. Uh, the software separates the, the, the photograph uh, automatically, so those for which the fiducial maps were detected uh, properly and those for which it didn't work. So uh, then when you do it manually, everything comes together in a, sim uh, in a single table and you have all the pixel coordinates of each uh, fiducial map. So then we reproject the image. So uh, what we do, we take the coordinates of the image. So the, the dashed red lines is the size of the scanned image. And then we crop uh, depending on the coordinates of, uh, of the fiducial mass. And what we do also is to reproject in a perfect square in the dimension that the, the image should have. And I will explain later why. Uh, because it's, it tends to have the best uh, result uh, uh, in terms of image usable for photogrammetry. Then finally, we resample, we downsample uh, the scan, because even though we scan at uh, 1500 dpi, most of the time the quality of the emulsion is lower than that. So we can just reduce that and it somehow uh, smooths the eventual uh, local distortions we can have introduced, or that we're already. Uh, there uh, and then we sharpen the image 
which is the first um, risk and stretching uh, step actually. But without this sharpening, photogrammetry works difficultly, very difficult. And then, uh, as a last option, we also create a mask if the fiducial masks are within the, the photograph. Now, the photogrammetric processing. We have a lot of distortions in these images. Uh, so, what we have is usually is a reproduction of the photograph. Sometimes we have copies of copies, so you don't know what kind of, of distortion you can have on top of the classical distortion coming from a camera. So it's a mix of many things, uh, and then we scan the photograph, so we may introduce also uh, a, a small uh, distortions. Um, so that's why we reproject uh, the image in a perfect square, with the hope that uh, somehow uh, part of this uh, distortion uh, are corrected. And then um, we have the, the, the pre-processed photographs we can use for photogrammetry. So the problem with these images is, of course, the overlap is very limited. Uh, usually it's 60% uh, along track, and across track, uh, unfortunately, we have something like 5 to 10%, which is not good at all. And as we do not have uh, any calibration reports, then we play with structure for motion with the hope that we can uh, correct the distortion of the camera as much uh, as possible. So. Um, then, because of that, uh, ground control points play a major, major role in the quality of the final results, uh, the final octo uh, mosaic uh, we get. But also, as these are historical IR photographs, and I'm pretty sure that uh, some of you uh, know it very well, finding ground control points in a landscape from the 1950s is not that easy, especially in Africa, where you have, um, um, yeah, uh, urban sprawl. Um, quick urban sport during the past few decades and, and the change in the landscape is, is very big. So I can here just show you the residual plots we have when, uh, when we have the calibration. This is uh, something we get and, and this is one of the best results we ever had with the historical angle photograph. So it's not that pretty bad but you see that the, the distortion, the remaining distortion is spread uh, uh, more or less randomly. <coughs> And then once you have a lot of ground control points, you can get something uh, relatively uh, correct. So this is the, the initial workflow we did. Uh, we used uh, uh, Agisoft Metashape Pro uh, as a software to do that. So of course we have the pre-processed images, we have the few camera information uh, we have, then the mask. Uh, we create a sparse point color, we filter it, we use the ground control points to, for the georeferencing. Once we have an optimized sparse point cloud, we perform the dance matching, but the result is relatively <coughs> bad. So what we used to do is to downsample uh, the, the dance point cloud and then use noise filtering to smooth the topography as much as possible. And once we have an optimized dance point cloud, uh, we produce a digital elevation model and then uh, an auto photo mosaic. Uh, the bounding box alignment is something that, that I apply to uh, Agis of Metashape uh, Pro because uh, sometimes uh, you have a difference between the orientation I mean the, the, the arbitrary uh, spatial uh, dimensions uh, of the software and the actual uh, um, uh, cartographic and geographic uh, coordinate system. Um, but what we tend to do now is because the digital elevation models are so bad, we mostly use the auto mosaics. Uh, we did something else, and which it works much better actually. It's uh, once we have the spice point cloud, we don't uh, do anything else. We just add an external DEM if we have one of a good quality, and then we create only an auto mosaic. And usually in mountainous areas, uh, it gives the best results. Um, so I will show you an example here. <coughs> it's a comparison between the two workflows. So we produce the same auto mosaic, but one with the topography extracted from the cameras and one uh, that comes from an external uh, digital elevation model. And um, <coughs> where, where you see it's blue, it's, it's, a, it's a flood plain. On the Rosizi River, you have Lake Tanganyika to the south there. The difference is very uh, small and usually correspond, you see, <coughs> circular patterns and, and, and most of the changes come from the fact that we didn't correct uh, the, um, the, 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 the distortion coming from the car very, 
very well. So we still have like circular radial patterns uh, uh, <clears throat> like that. Uh, and then when you go, you go to the mountainous areas, you see errors uh, for differences of more than uh, 10 meters uh, sometimes. Here is an example of digital animation model we have with the photographs. So usually when you use a single band, it's kind of okay, but when you start mixing uh, different bands of, of uh, IRL photographs, uh, we can see some big steps in the topography like that, and it's very difficult. And here is an example of, of, of uh, the, the implication of uh, the consequences of, of such uh, issues. When you have a road in the mountains, uh, you see it's supposed to be linear uh, here on the upper uh, right, and it's not. While when we use even here the SRTM uh, DEM, we get something much better, even though it's not perfect uh, yet. Okay, so so far what we <coughs> processed uh, uh, um, for a moment mostly cover Eastern Congo at the border with uh, Rwanda and Burundi. Uh, it was performed uh, in the frame of a research project that aims to understand the implication of. Uh, uh, land use land cover change on uh, the occurrence of landslides. And you have different uh, interesting papers. Uh, the paper of Dill et al. Uh, is supposed to be uh, online uh, tonight. Um, and then, uh, yeah, that's what they say. Uh, the paper of uh, the Picker uh, et al. works on uh, mostly the orange yellow uh, areas there. Uh, where we looked at deforestation and, and how it influenced the occurrence of landslides uh, in the area. Then the paper of Mboga uh, et al. is more on uh, developing uh, an object-based supervised classification to uh, extract uh, features uh, on the, the photographs uh, in urban areas. Okay, that's it. Thank you. something about uh, the digitization of historical area images in Baden-Württemberg, so it's a part of Germany. And we also want to present you our results about the uh, geometric resolution and accuracy of the phase one digitization system. Yeah, in our archive we store about 400,000 analog area aerial images and the figure shows from which years we have these photos. Besides the uh, wartime photos, especially this part is very important for us. From uh, 1968 on, the whole country, or the whole Baden-Württemberg, was um, surveyed in a five-year cycle. From 2009 on, digital areas, cameras have been used. Yeah, since October 2018, we have a project called the Digital Area Photo Atlas, the German Digital Industrial Atlas. And the goal of the project is the digital usability of these pictures and to make the data, data available for everybody. We divide into three steps, um, the digitization and the auto-rectification of selected aerial images, so not from all uh, 400,000 pictures, then the management and the administration of these pictures, and at least the provision via geodata services, so for example, VMS. Yeah, the project will continue until the end of the year. After that, it will go into a regular operation. And of course, we have some money for this project. Yeah, here you can see our, um, or at the beginning it was not clear which path you would take with the digitization. So we have the scanner, and, uh, but the scanner is very old and the company doesn't exist anymore. So a failure would, would be fatal for the project. And of course uh, you need uh, maybe 10 minutes uh, for the digitization. Yes. And we also have the, the IQ Smart Scanner, but for us, the scanner is not suitable for photogrammetric products. So we would therefore need a new or a other, 
<laughs> and we would definitely need a new or another photophorometric scanner. Um, that means um, we have high um, costs or maybe um, a new technology. So, for example, a new camera based technology. Yeah, and we decided <coughs> to take the camera. Yeah, so um, the LBR um, and the mapping agency of Bavaria um, decided in 2019 uh, to invest into this camera based approach using um, the phase one camera to scan um, the, uh, the photos in this project. Um, in principle, it work, just works like a document camera with the camera on top and then a light table where the camera the photos placed on and then the image is taken. Um, but since this is a new um, setup and the system hasn't been um, investigated yet, um, we uh, had a look at the um, system resolution and performance, performance, which I investigated in my master thesis last year. So, yeah, in summary, um, I looked at the determination and visualization of um, the effective resolution that can be obtained and um, a comparison of the effective resolution um, also with a uh, photogrammetric scanner which will come later on in the presentation. Um, so going to the determination of resolving power which is um, how these line pairs can be um, resolved at different spatial frequencies. As the spatial frequency increases um, there will be a point where uh, the camera can no longer um, discern the, the black and white pattern and this will be the, um, uh, the limit of the resolution. So, firstly, um, there's a way, the most obvious way is the visual interpretation using the 1951 um, test target or using a, a Siemens star, a Siemens star which um, has, uh, yeah, where this method is widely used to find a rough estimation of the resolu resolution quickly, it is insufficient um, for this type of high um, resolution because we are looking, um, firstly, it's very subjective where you, um, and um, it has a, um, a discrete pattern which um, is nothing, which is uh, therefore also insufficient when determining. Um, the resolution limit. Um, a Zenith star, on the other hand, is a, an alternative pattern, and this has the increase, uh, continuously increasing spatial frequency. Um, and using, but we didn't um, go for the visual interpretation. We went uh, for the calculation of the um, resolution limit using the modulation transfer function, which is. Um, uh, here on the next slide, um, an objective approach um, where we can uh, calculate the um, MTF and therefore um, also measure this, uh, the MTF at 10% uh, contrast ratio. <coughs> and at this, um, this limit at 10% is uh, in regarded in the literature as the resolution limit of, of a system. Um, so what we have is a, the 23 micrometers or the around 1,100 dpi of the camera and uh, the reference resolution of the printed target has to be higher than this. So we have designed a target and used a service provider that gives us 7 micrometers or 3,600 dpi. Um, and we designed the pattern in such a way that we have 25 uh, Siemens stars on this test pattern uh, equally spaced so that we can measure the MTF at um, 25 different points and also in interpolate this, um, the results into a, a um, basically a surface. Um, here's another slide where we have an image of the uh, test pattern that we use um, and it's basically the whole size of this uh, 23 by 23 centimeter um, aerial image. So, 
Let's skip to the results. Um, so these are the some of my results of my master thesis. Um, where you can see three different tests. The first one was taken right at the beginning and then a few months in between. And here we can really see the um, what was mentioned before this uh, uh, this variability in the um, achieved resolution. For instance, here in the first one, we can see um, this is actually um, very evenly spaced and evenly distributed um, across the whole uh, test pattern. Um, but when we measure the resolution again a few months later, we see it's much worse. And there's also this um, this pattern where we have a, a high resolution here at the bottom, and it's moving to a, a much lower resolution here, which uh, indicates the camera is out of focus or uh, not um, optimally aligned. So then this, the camera was recalibrated and refocused and then we I took um, another picture here. We see it's um, much better than the second picture again but um, it does not achieve the, the high resolution we found um, in, back in the first um, image which this indicates um, this variability that can happen with this camera. Um, what are other current issues? Current issues are we have a bit of a problem in finding a reasonable uh, a service provider that can manufacture these types of test patterns to these high resolutions. So, for instance, you can see this is a crop of the a Siemens Star Center um, of the first image uh, of the first test pattern where you can see there is some kind of limitation in the production itself of the test pattern. In comparison to the second one, we manufactured at the same manufacturer, we have better results, but there are still artifacts here in the middle of the uh, Siemens Star. And also other Siemens Star templates that we've come across during my research, you can see that there are the high variabilities between these, uh, the actual manufacturing of this uh, which is proving to be quite difficult. So this would be probably a good also forum to um, to you guys um, to maybe if there's interest that we can come across uh, and also um, maybe look at finding a service provider that can uh, achieve the uh, the uh, resolutions required for this test for a test pattern. Um, but moving on. We also have a um, camera data set of an analog um, flight that was flown in 2008 of the um, DGPF um, test field in Fine and Enz where um, <coughs> this um, flight was taken. And here we have this flight scanned with a um, traditional photogrammetric uh, linear um, scanner and then also the phase one scan station next to each other and um, this uh, allows us to um, compare the two um, digitized um, analog, uh, digital um, results of the analog uh, film. So here's a during the aerial survey um, there was a Siemens star pattern also um, flown over which um, can then also be analyzed using the same um, method we've used previously to determine um, the MTF at the 10% resolution limit, which is uh, using the software, um, as you can see here, a screenshot. And um, this, this gives us an indication of the whole um, system of the two uh, overlaying systems, the aerial camera and the scanner, or the aerial camera and the phase one, which we've used. Um, this position of the Xenos is of course, we can't um, control for that in the image, so it's always the way um, the original photo was taken, and therefore we've, um, I've grouped this, um, the, um, location of the scene is starting to repeat uh, different parts, the image center, the hot image, and the image edges, and um, which we can see on the next slide here, we can see the difference between the um, 
Z I scan from uh, two thousand the Z I scan two thousand and one with the um, GSD of around eight centimeters and then the calculated GRD or the resolved dis ground resolved distance in centimeters from um, using the um, um, MTF and the resolution from the Zeeman stars, where we can see there's a um, high difference when looking at the phase one at the moment where the actual the effective resolution is around double the um, GSD, which is um, an issue. Um, here we would, from a scientific standpoint, this would be um, actually a really nice comparison with the new scanners that are now um, have been presented today, how those um, scanners um, perform in comparison to the old um, traditional uh, photogrammetric scanner. Um, then we've looked at the independent checkpoints um, using a area triangulation, um, here again using the um, case one for the classical photogrammetric scanner. Um, the images which, um, and then um, two cases of the phase one scan station one who used the uncorrected original images that were um, digitized with the phase one scan station and then in the second case trying to um, reduce the additional distortion by calibrating the camera and then um, calculate um, or creating um, distortion corrected images um, using uh, in a pre-processing of those images. Uh, as you can also see, um, in this, uh, we have a very high density of um, good ground control points and a high um, overlap which is around 60% uh, in-flight and 70% across flight. So here you can see the results of, at those uh, independent checkpoints. Um, the first, all those three cases have been um, calculated using no, param no additional parameters, um, using the 12 parameter model and the 44 parameter model, and then using the same checkpoints um, across the whole um, investigation to um, have this, um, the two systems uh, comparable. Um, as you can see, the um, traditional photogrammetric scanner um, reaches its accuracy of around a quarter pixel uh, already with the 12 parameters and then has no marked increase um, when we use the um, more advanced model which has which is here um, we have a quarter pixel in X and Y and then half a pixel around <coughs> in the Z component um, using the uncorrected images um, we here have um, large variations in the Z. This is a problem and this is an indication that we have um, that there's some other um, distortion or something in, the, in those images that is not um, corrected for and therefore we have a, um, something that is um, not usable in this case. But when we look at the 44 parameters, this reduces <coughs> the or increases the accuracy <coughs> into the same um, range of the photogrammetric scanner. Um, however, the conditions of this test field have to be mentioned again. We have a high um, density of those high accuracy and high accuracy of those um, checkpoints. <coughs> and uh, again, the high overlap, which is not the case in um, historical aerial images. But this gives a good indication of what is um, achievable when um, having a good, good data available. Then with the um, distortion correction applied, we see um, the results actually get worse across the whole, uh, the whole board um, when we compare it to the overall accuracy of the, what can be achieved. Um, but we do see a, a, a reduction of this, these high um, um, values um, to around 65% of, of the pixel, which does indicate that there's something that is being corrected, but not everything is correct, and maybe also other distortions or something you, uh, came back into the images when you um, 
have another um, work for uh, press processing applied to this, which is that uh, that's still um, under current investigation. Um, yes, and now back to. Yeah, uh, back to the project and the timeline here shows you which use we have worked on so far and which we are currently still outstanding. At the beginning we wanted to cover the Baden-Württemberg every 20 years. So here we have the first run <coughs> and then every 10 years we can reach this with the second one. And now we have every five years and more it's virtually impossible because we have the five um, cycle. Yeah, and we are, we are currently working on the third uh, trench of uh, this BOP, and at the moment here, this one is currently being digitized. Um, yes. Yeah, after the historical BOP has been calculated, the data are made available internally in Vega. And here you can search for aerial, aerial photographs, hist DOP, or for other hist historical maps. It can be searched by attribute, special search, or by an address. The hits are uh, displayed in a list here, or visually. And it's also possible to see a preview. And the original data, so the geotip, can be downloaded by one click. Yeah, and of course the data is also made available um, via a geodata service. And this, and here we have a um, decade service. And yeah, this is integrated in our geo portal. And um, everybody can can watch our results from the project. Yes, and here it's also possible um, yeah, to, to see the difference between the two different years. And yeah. Okay, coming back to some final remarks, um, which we want to mention is that um, the analog film material which, uh, needs to be digitized now. We've heard a lot about this in the current session. Um, the lifetime of the film is uh, really at its maximum already and everything that's getting older now it's, it's becoming worse and worse in terms of quality and um, also deterioration of the film due to the storage conditions and everything else we've heard so far. However, anything, any information lost during this, the scanning process cannot be reconstructed ever again when the original film is no longer available so we have, really have to be careful and design um, the, the, also the digitization process have that in mind um, when we um, digitize so there's a real demand for uh, the sophisticated scanning solutions to re retain um, as much information as possible and also regular quality checks within the scanning process is uh, fundamental to um, guarantee that you always have the same um, outcome that is constantly um, uh, that you can scan with uh, constant quality and also there is um, in our opinion um, a demand for a high quality test environment that can be used with this uh, um, high resolutions that are required um, and this is currently a not trivial process to produce a, and we are looking for uh, input here as well um, coming back to phase one in general, um, it delivers a comparable um, result, as I mentioned, in the area triangulation that we've done using the test field with the additional par parameters, but um, as we've also heard about today, this is not guaranteed when we have um, the historical aerial images where we don't have so many um, ground control points and the high quality of those ground control points we don't have anymore or we don't have so this is an, another issue with, which we have to keep in mind uh, um, yes That's the end of our presentation um, thank you very much and if you want to read further on there's a 
published um, article and um, some more information on our website. Thank you.